Hi, I'm Johnny Heller, and you're listening to The Audio Flow with Jacques. And why shouldn't you be? Audiobooks never sounded so good. The Audio Flow with Jacques. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of The Audio Flow. I'm your host, Jacques. And this week, we are chatting with someone that I now consider a friend. He has recorded over 700 audiobooks and other voiceover work. He is a comedian. Of course, all of you who know him personally know that I tell no lies when it comes to that. He's a great friend and he's a coach uh, helping others get into this business of voiceover work. So please help Help me welcome multi audiobook award winner, Mr. Johnny Heller. Hi, Johnny. Welcome to the Audio Flow. How's it going? Very well. Thanks for having me on. I know we tried to do this for a long time, so it's good we finally made it happen. I know, but you went off and got married, and then you said, when I get back from Paris, and then you went traveling and did some more work, and then, yeah, like a couple months ago, we just we remembered that we never <laughs> talked. <laughs> <laughs> Life has a habit of getting in the way. It does, but we finally were able to do this, and I'm super excited about having you on the show. Of course, everybody says, once you have Johnny on your show, you're somebody. So I guess <laughs> today means I'm finally somebody. <laughs> yeah, people are lying to you left and right, I think. But yeah. <laughs> so it's it's all lies then. I'm not somebody, Johnny? Is you are, you are somebody, but it has nothing to do with me. <laughs> Okay, sure. We'll we'll say that. But okay, so of course you know that I was doing my research about you. Even though I had a chance to finally meet you, we still didn't have we didn't have time to sit down and chat. And so you're a Midwesterner, right? A, right across the bridge from me, right across 8094 from Chicago. Chicago born and bred. Well, the suburbs, but yeah, I'm a Chicago boy. I grew up in uh, went to college in Chicago and uh, mm-hmm. stayed there for lived in the city for a long time, right by Wrigley Field, as a matter of fact. And I came to New York in uh, 86. So, uh, so I was just going to ask you if you were a Cubs or a Sox fan. Well, I grew up a White Sox fan. My dad was a diehard White Sox fan, and I still mm-hmm. like the White Sox. But I lived by Wrigley Field so long mm-hmm. that I'm sort of um, I'm, I, I'm not one that hates one and loves the other. I love them both. But I prefer National League Baseball anyway. So I like the hometown Cubs. So that's fine. Okay, good. So that does that mean since you're a baseball fan, you're not a football fan? Um, if I'm picking one, I'm picking base. If I'm picking any sport, it's going to be baseball. Um, okay. I like college football. I don't mind if it's on TV, it's fine. It's like a backer. I no longer care that much about football. I guess that happens yeah. when you just, I don't know. I don't think I'll ever get to that age. You know, I'm, I'm in Indiana right there. And so everybody thinks I should be a bears fan and I'm not, and I'm not an Indianapolis Colts fan either. Who do you like? I knew you were going to ask. I, I'm You're going to say the Patriots, team. aren't you? Oh, Cowboys? Yes. I have, no object- I have no objection to that. That's fine. Yeah, that's because you're yeah. not a real sports fan. <laughs> I am a real sports fan, just not. Just I don't baseball. Give a shit about- oh, I'm sorry, I can't say it. I don't, you can I don't say care whatever about- you want. Oh, I don't care about, I like baseball. And the, and the rest of the sports are just something to do while well, we wait for baseball to come back. Okay, I got it. That's how most football people feel, too. It's like, I'll watch yeah. basketball just because it's on and wait for football to come back. Yeah. So. I, I like I watch the NCAA. That's what I like in basketball. Me I don't too. watch the drugs. Yeah. And usually I wait until it's the final four. <laughs> I don't watch anything before I, that. Well, I paid some attention because my college really did well for the first time ever, so I watched it. Okay. Well, yay you. Yay us. Loyola <laughs> University of Chicago did a great job. Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. Everybody, the Johnny Heller just gave you guys a shout out. I don't know how you feel about that, but that's yeah. freaking awesome. We, we need to post that somewhere <laughs> so they'll know you gave them a shout out. Loyola, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they'll care. Say, Who? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. So you were raised right here in the Midwest. And then at some point you went and, uh, and decided that you were going to leave the Midwest and you were going to go out and I i don't know why I like to use the term go and find yourself um, but you what did you study when you were here and did you always know that you wanted to go and pursue acting in some way shape form or fashion yeah I, I always knew when I when I was in Chicago I um, uh, graduated a degree in political science and American history and I was a, a wrote for the Chicago Sun Times uh-huh. the British I was a reporter and then I, I left that and started in community theater, but I still studied. I went into a three-year acting program at a school for performing arts by Ted List was my guru. 
And I got into voiceovers. I, 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 I thought I'd do Shakespeare all, all my life for 30 bucks a week and um, wait tables. Um, instead, <laughs> I, I, was a, a, I became a world-class bartender. And then I, um, but I, I started in voiceover work. My acting guru guy in, in those days was a, a, one of these deep, rich voice of God guys. And uh-huh. his agent came to class to talk to us. And they liked the, um, the timber and, and, sand, and sound of my voice because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's different, I guess. So um, they, they, they signed me to do commercial voiceover, and I got my first job immediately. And I was like, wow, this is awesome. So mm-hmm. I started doing that. And then when I decided to go to New York, um, the reasons are, are many, but I went there. Um, I had an agent in New York. I didn't know anybody here. It was a very tough first year. I didn't know one. But then I got to know everybody by playing softball in the uh, New York uh, Theater League. And that's how I made all my friends. And then one thing led to another, studied more acting, got some more stuff, did a lot of commercial on camera and voiceover. And then the audiobook world came calling, sort of. And mm-hmm. that's where I found my niche. I would love to know. Tell us some of those commercials that, you know, if we go back, we'll be like, oh, my God, it's the Johnny Heller doing uh, that's his voice. To be honest with you, the most successful, I've got some smaller things like in the, Someone's running in Baltimore. I did for a while. It's pretty funny. But what I did, here's a weird thing. So I'm studying all this Shakespeare and all this Stanislavski technique. And I'm really, I'm really into the acting, you know. I'm, I'm living. I've got no money for food or clothing in a crappy apartment, starving to death. But I'm acting. So, um, so I, I, uh, I go to this commercial audition. I tell the story all the time. I think it was, well, yeah, it was before internet, I guess. So these guys in New York want to have a campaign for Campbell's Soup. And in those days, ad agency people would get a group of people, who they can't, the art department and the, the creative department, and they travel to the big cities doing the auditions. It was an excuse for drinking and eating junket, I believe. But <laughs> So they go to New York and they interview an audition. They go to uh, L.A., interview an audition. They come to Chicago, and I'm one of the guys. And this is the third stop of their three-city tour here. Mm-hmm. It's a Campbell's Soup, and this was the audition, I swear to God, and also the job. I got it, and this is what I did. You ready? Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. That's what I did. <laughs> it's the um and I, good. I, 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 I said, no, that's not, not, not good. Don't be adding. Don't be adding. No. Don't be crazy here. It's <laughs> mm-mm. That's all I did. And I got the job. And it was a national. And I got, I think I made like $15,000 by saying, mm-mm. I'm like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> I'm working my ass off trying to get puck in the community theater. And, 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 and I'm saying, mm-mm. And just I crush it. I'm like, so I said, oh, my God. I said, this, this, is, this is what I want to do, you know, because why not? Why would you not do that? So, but there's very few of those, actually. I mean, that was my big success story. Then it went on to, you know, not hit. You can't pay a 1,000% commercials anymore. So then I think, and then I got other jobs like that, like, oh, like a few years ago, it was a commercial for a, what was it? It was a begging strip. Or, you, know, you know those dog things? The dogs. It, yeah, I would it, it was get a, it, it myself, was, but I don't have little, dogs. <laughs> yeah, a little plastic tub, and you could. Press a button and the treat would fly out. The dog would leap up and get it. Ah. And I always think, why don't you just unscrew the top and take it out? But that, I didn't say that. Instead, I was the voice of a dog. I was, woohoo! That's what I did. I was a leaping, <laughs> some kind of dog. Woohoo! That's, what I, that's my big claim to fame. So I, I'm making all this money doing this. I mean, I don't, I don't do as many commercials as I used to because that, that, that kind of um, ebbs and sw- uh, uh, flows mm-hmm. a little bit. And you never know if you're in demand. And, I haven't changed my sound or timbre or pitch very much in 30 years. So they keep sending that because I'm older, they send me off like older dad guys, but I still sound like I sound. So it's a little incongruity in there. So, okay. cause I, the reason I got into recorded books and audio books is because I sound at a youthful, hyper active kind of childlike style that they liked. I so gotta go back to the Campbell's. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I, I'm totally in the wrong business if I could, if, okay, was that the script or did you just go in and say, this is what I'm going to do? No, no, th- that's what they wanted. That's what, <laughs> that's what the script called for. Mm-mm. Had nothing, I didn't, I wasn't writing lines. That was what it was. They, that was literally the, I, the, the guy, my you know, voice one, whatever the hell he was, had one line. Mm-mm. That was it. <laughs> I was, that's such a rare thing that you're going to make that kind of money, get that one kind of line. It's just the. It's it's odd. It was it was crazy, but for me, a perfectly a perfect way to get into the business because it was um yeah because it was a weird thing and I'm a weird guy, so it all worked out. That's how you brand yourself. You're that weird guy. I do not brand myself. (laughs) 
Oh, and what's in the cup? So Johnny said that he needed a couple more min minutes because he needed to get some. Co and it says Mr. Wright. Yes. So did you did you buy yourself that mug or was that? No, given to no. You? Joanna has Mrs. Wright. I have Mr. Wright. Um, our cousin gave it to us. I like them because they're really big cups. But I prefer a big cup that's got a wider mouth. So you could uh, put milk and dunk cookies in if you want. This is only for coffee. I have a cookie cup and I have a coffee cup. This is my coffee cup. Oh, and, and you're and he's in the booth with his coffee, and so he has. You have a separate cup to to dunk cookies in. Would that be Chips Ahoy or Oreo? Neither one of those. No, they, I don't like those. They'd be Fantastic. more like no, 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 like you know, like like cookies, well made, good cookies from. With good stuff in them. I don't eat Oreos. I mean, well, I do love Oreos. I don't eat that. It's just, that was, I don't, I don't, I, don't, I try not to eat that much crap if I can avoid it. Uh, and by that, I mean those crap. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, just, that sounds yeah. boring. If you're not, it, you, the more crap you eat, the more fun you, well, no, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> the, more, the more dead you get. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't want you dead, especially because yeah. you are the guy. You've got over over six hundred books in your uh, in your catalog here. Of, of I, I think I think books. it may be over seven hundred by now. So yeah. seven hundred, seven hundred, and so you've got this career that started. You said over about thirty years ago, give or take or whatever. And so since you started, yeah, I think I'm guessing that's wrong. Let's see. Tell me, what I've it been. Is. Let's see. I'm trying to figure it out. Okay, college, and then I was a newspaper boy. <laughs> Let's see. I'm a newspaper man, I guess, writing and stuff, and I did a lot of stuff. I did stand-up comedy for a few years. That counts. I was going to ask you that. Yeah, yeah, I did it about three, four years, and then um, so I guess I've been in the entertainment industry since '81, '82, '81 probably. So, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a math man, but yeah, it's been a, a, a long time. Thirty. It's still thirty something. 30 yeah yeah, yeah 30 it's yeah, 2018 yeah. now so well yeah. you, you do you do the math that's beyond uh, my no business, math so. is not my thing yeah. no i'm not yeah, even yeah, going to touch I, it Every, our listeners <laughs> you add that up and tell us hashtag we so, don't math okay <laughs> somebody somebody subtract 2018 from 81 see what you get let us know yeah <laughs> yeah, there you go. And by the end of this episode, they'll have an answer for us because I, I'm not doing it. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier that you thought, you know, Shakespeare was going to be your thing. You was going to do, I guess you were really into theater. And, um, and, and so tell me about how that was. Shakespeare, do you have a favorite Shakespearean play that you were in or that you wanted to be in that you weren't cast in? Well, I'm still waiting to get old enough to be King Lear. <laughs> um, part of the issue is this: uh, when you study, I'm I'm all about the acting, and I, I was really, I think, very well trained, and it's and it's had all the difference in my career. Certainly, as it comes up, all the people who studied with me will tell you that's what I'm all about as as a as a coach. Um, you know, it sounds like these typical acting, you know, BS terms like moment to moment and beat to beat, and a very big and connecting to the author's truth. That's all Shakespearean. I mean, it's all, that's all um, that's all acting training. And Shakespeare, I think, is simply the best exercise an actor can get. Now, I'll be honest, it's been a while now since I've been delved in any Shakespeare. My favorite plays is probably Midsummer Night's Dream because I just enjoy the characters so much. But there's not any that I dislike. I remember one of the, I think in college, I think I did, I'm trying to remember now because this is a, a distant memory anymore. We did Much Ado About Nothing. And I remember that, <laughs> I remember this, you know, when you go up in a line, when you, if you screw up on, you know, in anything else, you can, like in, in audiobooks, you can mess up, you can fix it right away. Right, right. On stage, <laughs> it's trickier. And we had a fella named uh, Barney Berlin. He was in the uh, graduate school in, I can't remember his, he was a professor in the graduate school. Mm -hmm. And he played, he played, I'm trying to think, I can't think, he played like the, the, the humorous character in the play. And he had a line, he had to come out basically and say, all right, all right, um, everything's fine, I'll take care of this, but in Shakespearean mm -hmm. lingo. And I can't remember the lines, but neither could he remember his lines. And he came <laughs> out, and he just went, just clammed up. He went, ha, ah, oh, ho, oh, hmm, <laughs> ah. And then he looks around, puts his hands on his hips, and he goes, tis okay. And he walked off. <laughs> <laughs> tis okay. That's still my favorite cover. Tis okay. <laughs> And so I bet when you are going through acting anywhere and you're like, you mess up, is that something that comes to your forefront? Your forefront? Uh, always, always. I'll never forget. It. I, I mean, 
This is, I can't. I apparently I will forget. I can't remember the line he was supposed to say, but I do remember "tis okay," <laughs> which I think I think is just brilliant. But I, I mean, I did I did a lot of theater. I did um, but then I realized. I mean, I started making lots more. I did theater. I do uh, like a show. I did Sheer Madness in Chicago for a while. I do my show, and I drive out to the suburb by O'Hare Airport and work comedy clubs till three in the morning or something. And I, so I and I started booking, you know, out of town gigs as a comic. Um, and started making some money doing comedy, and then I started making good money in voiceover. Um, and I started to realize I'm not making any money in theater. And even now, um, I haven't been on stage in a show in ages. A, a buddy of mine wrote a play, a short play. We're going to be doing it in September in New York. Uh, it's been my first return to the stage in, in many years. Mm-hmm. So I'm really looking forward to it. But to be honest, once you start doing well enough that you're a full-time professional actor, but you're not in films and television, your income is, is you know apparently good enough to live on in New York because that's what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. But it's I can't I can't give up a few weeks or four weeks or three months and do a off Broadway show for 150 dollars. Right. You know, cause, and and that's it's I mean it's really the most organic acting in the world outside of audiobooks, but the pay is so crappy unless you're on Broadway. Mm-hmm. And and what happened was while I always I always thought I'd be a a, a comic second banana in film and television. Um, and what happened was I just became a voiceover guy and through, because that's when my work came and that's what happened. And I became more of a voice actor. I don't even have an on-camera agent, um, which seems odd to me given the fact that I'm, I'm lovely. So I'm confused by that. Yeah. <laughs> you are, you are quite lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So it's on my resume. We'll, we'll do, we'll do lovely scenes. Yeah. I love it. I, I love that you said that you uh, used to do stand up comedy because um, just after meeting you and seeing different things that you uh, do, do and say and post on social media, I totally got that. And so that was one of my questions was, have you ever done comedy? And so when you did stand up, how was it like writing your own jokes? Did you write them or did you kind oh, yeah. of just... And so what's that process like, especially because you said that one, first of all, everybody, his background, his, your degree was in political science, which really veers totally off into what you're doing now. And then you wrote, and then you wrote for a newspaper and then you were a comedian and then you went into theater. And so it's kind of like, how did that progression even start? Well, I don't know. I've always been into entertaining people. Funny has always been my thing. Um, I, I, laughing and making people laugh is that's my favorite thing. There's, there's nothing beats it for me. So I did write my own comedy. Generally, what I would do, my set would be, um, you know, what you develop, you try things out and realize that, that they work or they don't work. Um, and, and, and playing live houses is a great way to build, you know, find out what works. And you take what you think is a five, ten minute bit and you realize it isn't. It's a minute bit, mm-hmm. you know. You just you just keep getting rid of the crap and keep working, 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 and suddenly you've got a nice set. And I can I can usually do a, a nice five ten minutes on almost any topic if I have a little time to work it out. I try to be um, up to date. You know, I try to be you know, contemporary with headlines and things. And then I go into my other stuff. Mm-hmm. You can always about your family, just all kinds. Of, I know there, there's always things that work. So mm-hmm. if I'm doing something that's topical, uh, say about the hideous president we have, and talking about him. Then, then, then I might say, okay, this can go anywhere. Let me go to something else. I'll do family or something. There's, there's always these bits you know will work, mm-hmm. but you only know they work because you try them so much. But there you go to and you savor. So you have like, um, you want to get the working comic wants to get an hour time or more, or as close to that. That's all good. You want to keep freshening it up. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, so I, I, I did a lot. I, the last time I actually did stand up was a couple of years. I quit for a long time. Um, but then I did. I got invited to speak um, at the uh, American Library Association in Denver, and there were like four people speaking. And I decided instead of talking about audiobook, I would just do comedy about librarians because that's what they were. So I did like a fifteen-minute librarian set. It went over great. It was just fun. I had a great time. They had a great time. I wasn't trying to teach them anything. I was having a good time because when I was a kid, the library in Lombard, Illinois, in my hometown, Helen Plum Memorial Library, that's where I hung out. And they were always so ridiculously nice to me. And I thought, these, these are just the best people. So uh, I'm, I've always, I'm a huge fan of libraries and librarians. And I, and I like that 
when comedians can take something that's personal or stories about themselves or things that they've seen, real things, um, and they can take that and make it funny. And I think I listened to uh, Kevin Hart's. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Really long audio book, but it was so much information in there, and so I relate that to uh, what you said about you know well with his story and how at first he thought he was funny and he wasn't, and he started using real life stories and situations, and that's when people kind of relate to that. So I can relate to libraries, and I I can remember my first I can remember going to the library and how not well I can remember the not so friendly librarians that you know. <laughs> We're just like, no, the book's not in. Check back on another. They weren't nice. So I probably uh, I, I, would do something about that. I've never met a not nice one. They always seem pleasant. But, um, really? Well. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I travel around a lot and yeah. speak to libraries for recorded books. So mm -hmm. my relationship with them is, and also now I know them and they know me as Johnny Heller, you know, 700 audiobooks. He's a star. So they treat you a little nicer See? than they might have had some, some wildebeest off the street, you know. <laughs> coming in looking for an explanation of the Dewey Decimal System. Yeah. <laughs> I bet. Uh, okay, I would say our listeners don't know who that is, but they but they know you're Dewey gonna, Decimal System. You know, some people don't know what the Dewey Decimal System is. Everything. Well, became, tell me about the yeah. A library, by the way, is is where you go for cheap and free entertainment. There's um, there's tons of books. A library has movies you could take, has magazines, newspapers, books. It's just a wealth of stuff to do, and as we as you and we go through recessions and economic downturns, and the government always seems to take money from the libraries, which is the place in the community that gives you everything you need mm -hmm. when you can't afford to spend seventeen dollars on the latest uh, Marvel superhero film. Yeah. You know, there you go, everybody. Go and visit and support your local libraries because it's a wealth of information there. And just to go back. Now, for those of you kiddies who don't know what the Dewey Decimal System is, that's how we used to find the books. It was in a nice little uh, catalog, and you have to go through there, and they were all lined up by number. Yeah, it, it you know, like, you... like, like like history had a number, and the specific book had a number, exactly. whatever the main number was. And then, uh, why, are they not doing that? Are the Dewey Decimal System gone? There's are they not no... doing it? Yeah, there's now it's all computer. You go in, you type in what you're looking well, for. That's horrible. You go... Yeah, it's, no one, it's all no gone, one Johnny. No one's learning anything anymore. <laughs> Goodbye, Dewey Decimal System. I think that was that went away once uh, the internet came in. Well, you know. you're younger. Did did you ever did you ever have to go through life trying to memorize phone numbers, or was it always cell phones? I'm I'm a lot older than you probably think I am. So oh, cell phones. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, I had to remember I had a telephone book. Yeah, yeah, you had a little yeah. book. I yeah. got a buddy now who still has a little black. It's not a black because he. It's not. <laughs> good, but it's sure? black. It's, it's a black book. book. It's, it's a black book, and it's got all these phone numbers. And he has a. I think he has a flip cell phone too. So it's kind of. Oh gosh. You know, he's still yeah. still a throwback. Yeah. <laughs> That's a way throwback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crow Magnon <laughs> man. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. So okay, so I know that you've narrated. Um, I'm gonna kind of segue here. You've narrated pretty much uh, every genre. Um, Which is why I don't brand myself. And that's a good thing. You shouldn't, should, I guess, unless you want to be in a specific genre for long term. Um, do you have one or a particular topic that you enjoy on a leisure level? Not so much work, but just on a leisure level. Okay, yeah. So what I what I read for my own enjoyment versus yes. narrate. Okay. Yeah. Um, fortunately for me, they frequently match. Okay. I read a lot of noir, you know, private eye stuff, which I mm -hmm. frequently narrate. Um, I also read anything that's allegedly funny, <laughs> if I can find it. Then I say alleged because a lot of times it isn't. <laughs> I read. I read. Um, I'm I'm a madman for uh, presidential biographies. Mm -hmm. um, certain presidents I prefer more than others, so I have more books on others. But I've got a huge history library. My, my apartment's too little, so they're, most are boxed and in storage. But I've got tons. I read a great deal of um, military history mm -hmm. about battles and things, and I read a great deal of uh, just a great deal of history. Um, my tastes are a bit eclectic, though, because I bounce around quite a bit. I try to read as much as I can that isn't assigned reading for my narration work mm -hmm. to keep myself, you know, reading other things. So I'm trying to read as much as I can, but it's obviously impossible. Yeah. But for most of the books I get to record, I literally just finished a book, a very short. Very short, condensed history of World War II. I just finished 
maybe 20 minutes ago. And I, I started it. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's like eight hours or something. I just, so I just did it between Tuesday and today. So um, it was great because I, I knew everything he was saying. It was condensed. It was just an overview of everything. I mm-hmm. like that kind of thing. It's like the Cliff Notes version. Kind of, but it's pretty, it's pretty well thought out. I mean, what I liked about it is like, you know, when you take a tour of a new city, let's say you go to San Francisco mm-hmm. and you take the tour bus and he drives you to all these different areas and you would not see those areas just wandering about. But on the bus, you see them and you say, I want to go back to this area and investigate. And that's what I do. So I find the area that sounded cool, make notes, and then we'll go back to that area and hang out a little bit. And I think that's what you do with these overviews of history. Mm-hmm. Which area do you want to concentrate at? Now, here's here's the big menu. Now let's go deeper. Yeah. Gosh, I think that because of your, uh, I guess, your your degree, I always try to bring this in and try to see how that degree really plays into a person. Uh, political science. So that tells me a lot about you, um, that you are really into, um, like you said, uh, history and politics. Um, and so... <clears throat> I'm just going to go out uh, a little bit here. Um, sure, go out on that limb. Go for it. <laughs> um, you said that you enjoy reading uh, about uh, certain presidents and, and reading those biographies and autobiographies and stories about them. So who's been your top your top favorite uh, to kind of read about or learn more about? Top um, five. Top five. Lincoln? Mm-hmm. Teddy Roosevelt? Mm, I gotta think now. Now it gets tricky. Um, um, I, I, I read a lot of John Adams, but I kind of think he's a ponce. Um, I have some issues with him. Um, I, I, I'm keen on. Um, I mean, I, I guess uh, Franklin Roosevelt. I thought highly of. Mm-hmm. Um, Kennedy's history was just too too short. As a president, I think, yeah. um, sadly, of course, um, I'm reading, I'm reading, actually, I'm listening to, uh, the Grant biography, Robert Schoen. I've read a lot of Grant. I think he's an underrated president. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought in terms of making huge changes in the president, I thought McKinley could have been great. Um, I think, um, Andrew Jackson had a ton of issues, but he was an interesting president. Uh, j- just in terms of his story is interesting. You know, and I'm not going to go into whether or not he's, you know, all the founding fathers into the 18, mid 1800s were, were slave owners and traders. So I'm not right. going to deal with how bad that is. That's a bad thing. But in their culture and time, it was a normal thing for those right. guys. Right? No. Bad? Yes. So, but that's what they are. So I'm not going to worry about that. But very interesting things happen. I thought James Monroe was an interesting president. And um, I like that you pick, I like that you pick um, presidents really that a lot of people don't they don't. We don't talk about them enough to even know who they are or what they accomplished or what kind of person they were. Uh, like you don't really hear people talk about McKinley. Like I only I think about it now because I drive down that street <laughs> here when I go to work. You know, I, I drive. Yeah. I see Adams. I go down Adams Street every day. But you don't really think about them just yeah. in general conversation. What What we learn, I think, though, when we look at these guys, is that you you can't look at history and historical figures just from dusty pages in a book. These are real people. Right. And uh, the sadness, well, the, the difference is right now, here we are doing a live blog, mm-hmm. right? Our, our blog is going to be go live. So I don't know how you do it. Anyway, so, but this is happening right now. And if, if, a, if a politician right now says or does something, the media knows about it immediately because of all the social media and all the cameras. Well, when Millard Fillmore said something, no one knew about it unless it was written. No one knew who the hell the guy was. Right. With the immediacy of the media has changed everything. Right. We know a lot. We know all about, like we know all about the, um, Michelle Obama, Melania Trump. We know all about these people. Mm-hmm. You can't name any other first ladies going back. Right. That wasn't part of the world. It wasn't part of the deal. And all the backroom deals they made and whether or not they were, you know, horrible people or great people, you had no idea. Right. You know? I think I think Truman was a fascinating guy. I like him as president. Fascinating. I'm not a big I'm not as big a fan of Eisenhower, but he's interesting. You know, these guys are powerful guys. Did they did they do end arounds like our current guys doing, or were they shady bastards like Trump? Sometimes, but we don't know about it as much because right now news is immediate. Right. If I say something right now that's uh, uh, 
racist or sexist or wrong at any level, we're going to know about it right away. Yeah. And it's, and it's one of those things that you can't, uh, once you say it, and of course, uh, people report on it, you can't go back and say you didn't say it because we've got all no, this no. evidence that proved that you did. <laughs> no, all, all we can say now is if you care at all, you can say I misspoke. People say that all the time, which is a, which is a polite way, a political way of saying I was fucking lying. Yeah. I, I said misspoke. it, and darn, somebody yes, heard yes. it. <laughs> Wait, the microphone was on? Well, you know, Pres- President Trump said what he said about grabbing women by, you know, he yeah. said it. Yeah. He's never said I misspoke. He just hasn't said a thing about it, so it didn't happen. Right. And and, and his supporters don't seem to care that he's misogynist. Now, well, I shouldn't turn this conversation into it. I'll let it stop now. Yeah, we go. should we should probably and go I'm into the other that. direction. <laughs> and and being that I uh, somebody told me that when you have a podcast, technically you are still in some way, shape, form, or fashion media. And Absolutely. so I um I usually try to stay neutral with every conversation that I have. I never really say, Well, yeah, I agree with that or whatever. Um but be offline, tough with me. I I usually do. I go back and say, yeah, I agree with that or I didn't. So, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. But I would never tell you you can't say whatever you want to say on the show because, hey, you're you're Johnny well, Heller. So <laughs> well, I'm, just... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. I'm going to try. I'll leave the uh, – but you brought up – Well, I I'm, Anyway, so we'll stop. I'll, I'll leave it be. I had to because we have to know about you and your whole political science aspect well, and yeah. what you like to, you know. You, yeah, you, well, you, I would, I would – People get to know about me. Seriously, I'm on Facebook, and I yeah. say exactly what I think. You do. And and, I, and sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's serious, but I say it. I have uh, the John, uh, johnnyheller.com, where my blog, for the hell of it, is out there. I just had a new blog just yesterday I posted mm-hmm. about awards and stuff. So that you can tell them, uh, whether you think I'm funny or not, it's entirely up to you. But I think you can tell them at least I think I'm funny. So, <laughs> and that's all that matters, right? It, it's all that, no. well, <laughs> no, not really. No, I know. <laughs> No, that would suck. If, I, <laughs> if you were the only one that thought you were yeah, funny, life that would, would be a problem. Not funny. Life would be it would be unlivable for me. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love the title of your blog. So, um, in between doing pretty much everything, you're coaching, you're also performing, narrating, and you're writing a blog, and you've you've kind of just do everything, and you're a husband. How are you managing? And you're traveling. How are you managing all of that? And you still have hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, the hair, the hair is not going anywhere. I don't, I don't. We, no, no, no one's lost. We, we're all hairy bastards on our side. Um, <laughs> let's see. I guess it would th- it's thinner a little bit, but it's still there. Um, it's still mostly still black too, um, or brown, whatever color it is. Um, now I've forgotten the question. Um, <laughs> how are you maintaining that how, balance? How am I doing? So well, first things. off. First off, uh, I'm I'm doing I'm literally doing what I love, which makes things less work and more. Do I get overwhelmed sometimes? Yes. Um, I've made some. I've got some travel plans coming up. I'm working on the. Uh, I just finished the Johnny Heller Fourth Annual Splendiferous Workshop in New York. The newest big thing coming up. Uh, Scott Brick and I are going to be doing a. Uh, we did a. a Business of Audiobook Seminar in L.A. in January. We're bringing it to New York in September 15th. Mm-hmm. Plans for that. And I'm planning um, with Joanna Perrin and Stephen J. Cohen, the, uh, what's it, our third New England narrator retreat up in Rhode Island for the October 19th weekend. Mm-hmm. That's that's such a great time. So I'm writing up the agenda for that. Plus, I've got uh, five books in the queue. And I'm working on a trip to uh, uh, Denver with Sean Pratt and I'll be in London in October teaching as well. So a lot going on, mm-hmm. but it's while there are specific things that kind of get a pain in the butt and this and that. First, I enjoy life. I try to enjoy everything. Joanna and I take staycations. If we're home here, we live in Manhattan, and we'll go out and we'll just enjoy something. Let's do something. Um, in terms of the husband part of it, we've been together for years and years and years. So we finally got married in uh, 2016. So we've been married recently but we've been together a long time yeah. so the husband part is is i insisted on that race basically it wasn't her it was me but um but i you know i she's she's my partner so i'm totally there's no it's under the work i i think you have to work to keep i bring her flowers every week and i always have done that though there's nothing i'm not doing that i ever didn't do um i just i'm not 
the most organized guy, and I'm not really good at tech stuff, but I am pretty good at ideas and stuff. And the thing is, the reason I do so much is because I'm I'm constantly in motion. I'm not good. At, I'm not good at sitting still. Uh, uh, I get antsy quickly. Um, I've got a, a short attention span. <laughs> I'm just. It's like a, you know. And so, and I run at a high energy all the time. Mm-hmm. And then what happens is, sometime or another, it just like a car runs out of gas. I just fade. Mm-hmm. Just boom, and I have to rest. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, I just I have to keep going. I only have one speed. Yeah, I can tell. I mean, at APAC, I saw you, and then we saw each other, and then we did it, and I turned around, I'm like, he's gone, and I'll catch up with you. Okay, we'll catch up. And then we just, it just, everybody was just moving around. But that's a good thing, that you keep busy, and um, you'll probably be one of those people that never retire. And, oh, I don't plan on never retiring. If I, if I win the lotto or something, I'm, I'll keep, I'll, I may say no to more books than I say no to now, but um, I, I'll never stop doing this. Well, that's, and, and I want to talk about, let's talk about all of your awards because you've got so many that are on your list. So you were nominated for an Audi this year. You totally, <laughs> you, was totally <laughs> you were supposed to win. You were robbed. You were robbed. Okay. He did not I, I was you robbed. say that. <laughs> I was, was robbed, robbed, I tell you. <laughs> I, here, well, you know, actually, I, I, to be honest, I thought that book would win because I thought it was just charming. It's a wedging gizmo. There's a Wedge in Gizmo 2 out now, and there'll probably be 3 and 4, but so maybe next year it'll, it'll win. But my blog, the newest one, is all about awards. I don't know if you read it. It just came out. And and my thing is this. Yeah, I, I've won Audi Awards, and I've won I've won a bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's nice. It's nice to be honored. It's fun to dress up and have a good time. Yeah. Would I rather win than lose? Well, absolutely. But I think for a guy who's – so I'm not going to be two-faced. I've accepted the awards. Mm-hmm. I'm involved in it. But I don't think it's. Uh, I, I don't think it, it's it's possible even to say that uh, that Simon Vance's or Scott Brick's work reading this thing is better performance wise than 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 Dion Graham reading that thing. You know, right. when you get to when you get to awards for arts, you know, best actor, best actress, best supporting. How the hell do you decide that? Right. I mean, if the if the actor does the job and and plays the author's truth and plays the scene honestly. That's that's the reward. Right. The work is the reward. And the biggest reward, I think, and this is the whole point of my blog, is when you get the job and then get the next job. Mm-hmm. The awards are nice. They're not, I've got you know earphones all over the. I don't know how many I've got. I got a bunch of earphones. They're they're in a, a, a file drawer somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got all these. Um, I've got a couple Audi awards. They're sitting there, you know, on on the on the bookshelf. Lovely to look at. You know, handy if. I want to hit you know an intruder over the head with a block of uh, masonite there, but That's other than really that, big. <laughs> yeah, it's just a big funky. I mean, it's nice. They're, um, I don't. Yeah, it's it's. I'm not going to say it's not nice. It's nice to be honored. It's nice. It's nice. It's nice. They're all good. Anyone who calls you, like if you win the award for best podcast ever, that's great. Depending on who gives it to you, right? You know, if 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 it's a steel manufacturers association who doesn't even know podcasts, what difference does it make? You know, <laughs> you know the. The Toastmasters of Gary, Indiana, give you a podcast award. I mean, <laughs> right. what difference does it make? Yes. If it's from your peer, if it's from a group of peers, that's kind of nice. Yeah. But I think my reward in this business is A, getting to work in it, and B, getting actors to come to my workshops or one-on-one with me mm-hmm. because they want to they want to work with me. And I think that is a sign to me that that what I say matters and that I have some gravitas in the industry. And that's, and that's what I care about. Mm-hmm. The awards are nice, but I don't know any single publisher or any actor who got more work or any publisher who had sought out an actor having one in your phone or an actor who won it and then got a job because of it. Right. I think it's great resume fodder. You know, if I can say I won 25 to 30 earphones, that sounds better than the guy who said, um, I know what an earphone award is. <laughs> you know, that, right. that's different. Right. So that's all. But, you know, but I think too much can go into this. We like to give each other awards. We like it. And yeah. I was, I'm like, it's nice to get an award, but, you know, just work. Yeah. It's just different. Everybody has this different sense of um, what they what they measure success by. I I find that 
there are probably more people now that measure success in that way that you mentioned. What's rewarding to them is that they they were able to complete a, a project that they uh, felt strongly about, that they believed in, and then uh, and they were continuing to be able to do that. And so, um, you know, I think if if we worked more at that then we would find that self-efficacy a lot more, um, a lot better than, and of course, again, so here's my reward to me. See, I'm, I'm the girl, girl boss. boss. <laughs> <laughs> and every day that I can say I own my own business and I'm doing something that I enjoy and people respect me and um, and they know what we do and what we're about, that's rewarding to me. So there, okay. there's my spiel. Um, no, that's a good, that. and, and, and it's an important point too, though, because I think a lot of the, um, and I've seen this from some of the um, when I when I worked with some of the uh, at the time newer talents in the audiobook industry who are now really doing some great stuff. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily because I did anything, but because they're really good. Like uh, Melissa Moran and, and Joe Hempel and my good friend uh, Joel Leslie Fumkin is just wonderful and a great coach. Uh, uh, Kevin uh, 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 um, James Foster. These just great people. What they are rewarded by the fact they they understand that. This is not just an art form. It's also a business. Mm-hmm. They're learning to promote themselves, to market themselves. You have to remember that there's how many. When I started in the audiobook industry, it was a you know, multi-million dollar business. Now it's a multi-billion dollar mm-hmm. business. And everybody and their damned uncle thinks they can do it. Right. And they can't. Mm-hmm. So it's important when you find out that when you know you can, when you're an actor and your desire to do this is so strong, you can't do anything else. That's when you should do this and get good at it. And, yeah. and you'll be rewarded with work if you're good. And if you're not, understand that there's something to be said for finding the thing you are good at. Right. And that's a good segue for us to kind of chat a little bit about coaching, because um, I, I will say there's probably three, four, five, five of you guys <laughs> um, <laughs> that are very well known for providing coaching. Um, for either people who are currently in the industry and looking to continue with their skill set um, or people who are new in the industry and they want to test it out and see if they've got the skills and, and, you know, being able to speak with you. Now, how upfront are you? Well, let me start with, okay, so somebody, let's say, for instance, somebody wants to take this route. They want to get into um, acting on, you know, narrator or voiceover whether it's commercial or, or what have you, and you don't really feel like they've kind of got what it takes. How upfront are you? Or how do you kind of tell somebody maybe they should, maybe you should not try that. And <laughs> I, I wait. Okay. I, I'm very upfront. I'm very honest. Um, I do some coaching out of edge studio. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, you can, you can get me through my website. Or if you're in New York, you want to Skype, you can use edge studio. But what I tell people, Kind of depends what they want, but I always tell them, look, there's no guaranteed demo working with me. I don't care what anybody says. I won't make a demo or direct a demo, or help anyone with a demo unless I think they're ready to make a demo. That's one thing. So I'm not promising stuff. And I think if you work for someone for a weekend, the end of the weekend you get a demo. I, I question that. Right. Because if you're a demo means you're ready, you're ready to compete. Mm-hmm. And I don't think a weekend makes you ready. On the other hand, if you're a complete stranger to the business, voiceover world, mm-hmm. or uh, a fairly newbie. I think we need to talk a little bit about why you're into it, what you hope to get out of it, what are your aspirations and goals, and what's your background. Mm-hmm. Is there any acting background? If, for example, I, we're talking and you um, you have a, like a, a strong list for you know some kind of vocal problem, that's going to be a problem. I'm going to talk to you about that. Right. Are you aware that you sound like Barbara Walters? You know, or worse, you know, can I, can you do that? Um, I try, what I tend to do is say, look, if you want to do this, uh, I think you should pursue it. Um, but I think you should get some acting coaching first, meaning I direct people to go scene studies and improv workshops mm-hmm. to try and loosen themselves a little bit because voiceover acting is acting. Mm-hmm. And I think it's all about making choices. And I think if you have no background in that whatsoever, and also let's say, let's say you live in a small town somewhere, then get into community theater production. Mm-hmm. Not only is it fun and great and great for the community and a great way to meet people and just just a wonderful time, you'll accidentally learn stuff. Mm-hmm. And so what I try to do is if, if I think they're just god awful, <laughs> I'll tell them. I, I, I'll never say that. I'll say something like, I'm not sure this is for you, but I will say if I really think I can, 
let me try and direct you to other coaches who may be better for you if I think I'm not the guy. Or I'm not going to say don't pursue acting because if it's your dream, you have to pursue it. Right. But you have to understand who you're competing against. And you have to understand whether or not it's for you in the long run. But go ahead and dip, you know, go ahead and try it. Yeah. You know, that's fun. At least, but don't try to, don't go spending $5,000 or $10,000 on all the equipment when you haven't even had a workshop or a class. Then right. you don't know what it's about. Yeah. I wonder how many people, and it, it happens. I, I don't even have to ask myself how many people kind of just wake up one day or they have this, you know, in their head that, oh, I'm going to. I'm going to go narrate audiobooks or I can do that. And I, I, I've said it so many times. It's like, it's not, it's not as simple as you think it is. I promise you, it's not just sitting in front of a microphone and reading a book. It's, I mean. It's, yeah, sure. well, Sean Pratt tells people who want to do it. He says, why don't you go in the closet for three yeah. hours and read out loud for three hours. Yeah. You like it. Yeah, there is, if, if you want to hear, I'll tell you, you know what? My friend Aaron DeWord uh-huh. wrote a great blog about the, all the things you need to consider if you want to begin narrating. Mm-hmm. And I think it's fabulous. Let me share it with you guys. It's called Step Up to the Mic, M I C. Step, all one word, Step Up to the Mic dot Weebly dot com. Okay. And it tells you steps to take mm-hmm. to begin your investigation of audiobook narration. Mm-hmm. I cannot tell you how many people I, I meet and I tell them what I do. Go, oh, I'd like to do that. I think, mm-hmm. Well, you know. I, you're a dentist. I don't say, well, crap, I know where teeth are. I can do that. I'll pull these suckers out. I can do that. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's crazy. I think it's, I think one of the problems is, is that a lot of people don't understand that it's a real industry. It's real business and it's real work. And they think, yeah, yeah. and, and they have misconceptions of what an audio book is, is that somebody is sitting there and they're reading a book and, and like, and you and I have said several times, it's acting. It doesn't even matter if the person is narrating uh, nonfiction. Uh, it's just diff- a different process in it, but it's still a, a skill that you have to um, put some work into doing. And I, you know, back in the day, you know, we used to read out loud and people would, you know, read us stories and, you know, all of that. So one day I said, I'm going to pick up a book. I'm just going to read out loud to myself and see how that sounds. You know how many times I messed up? And that again, I said, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is not easy. And I did that sitting in the closet because <laughs> it's hot in there, first of all, and I'm claustrophobic. <laughs> and so that would never be, uh, even with doing um, the podcast, I sat in the closet once and I tried it and I said, this isn't, this isn't something that I could ever see myself doing full time. I just hats off to everybody that does this um, and who are, who are performers and take it very seriously because it's not just a hobby. It's not just something that you just yeah, up yeah. And decide to do. And, and there's nothing wrong with having a hobby and that may lead to something else. But this right. is a, you know, when you decide you want to be an audiobook narrator or a voiceover commercial guy or something, you're competing with me. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean I hate you. It just means that that's your competition. Now, mm-hmm. if it's not a, a well-known if, – if my price is higher per hour than other people's because mm-hmm. I've been around longer. So they may not want to pay Johnny Heller's price and therefore go somewhere else. That's fine. Mm-hmm. That's fine. I'm not hurting for work right now. Right. But it, it is a business and it's competition. You've got to walk into this with your eyes open because it's not just a lark. Mm-hmm. People take it seriously, and they should. Yeah, they should. And on that note, we're going to take something, we're going to do something that's not as serious because you guys know that on every episode, I have to end with the game after I give, you know, Johnny, I'll give him a chance to do his last spiel and all that good stuff. But um, (laughs) because I know that, I know that you're a fun guy. So this is going to be, this is going to be interesting and, and we'll probably, so we're going to do heads up. We're going to do two rounds and, um, I'm going to give you a chance to select which category you want. So heads up, I'll just tell you, it's like $25,000 pyramid or $100,000 pyramid, depending on I got on kicked how off that show. Are. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh when I was in LA. Yeah. Yeah. That is yeah. so cool. I love that. I really got, I got furious with the guy. I thought the guy I was trying to work with was an idiot and I went crazy. Uh, I said, what are you, I said, what are you, a fucking idiot? How hard is this? I was screaming. Uh, I was Jerry Seinfeld. I was like, come on. What's wrong with you? I said, not hard. <laughs> I know. Who doesn't? <laughs> okay, now I can't think because now I hear is all I hear. Wait, do, do I get? Can I put in a plug for my upcoming stuff? You will after we do? we do this round. You get oh, a whole okay. section. 
A whole okay. plug. Okay. Okay. So here we. So here's the categories you can choose from. Now you were a bartender, so you get either bottoms up, or you can get um, acted out. That would be me doing the acting. Okay. I don't know if you want to go that route. Or, I'm all confused. Yeah. No. Go ahead. Or you can you can go with uh, sound it out. So we have sound it out, bottoms up, or act it out. And basically, I have these clues here, and I have to do something to get you to guess what the answer is. Oh, all right. Let's try bottoms up. Bottoms up. Okay. All right, everybody. We are going to test out. Uh, basically, this is to see if I really know what these drinks are. So oh, is that what it is? Drink, oh, drink? Oh, yeah. oh my God. It's all, it's all drinks. I'm, I'm going to stop. Okay. So wish us luck, everybody. <laughs> oh, this is the time of day that every that drinks start. They're usually happy half hour. Off. Yes. Um, oh, when you want to go and you're probably going to drink a while, you give them your credit card. This is what you... you Run the tab. Uh, well, in other words, opposite of close. Open a tab. Okay, yes. Go. Um... Oh, okay. So this is a, uh, uh, oh gosh, it's that squishy stuff, and it usually has fruit in it, and then uh, the people add alcohol to it, and it comes like puree. No, no. Um, it comes in fruit. Uh, Margarita. Bill Cosby used to do used to sell this Jello. product. And okay, Jello. and then you're doing you Jello see? shots. Yes. Um. Oh, it's the opposite of 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 being tipsy. It's like I'm totally sober. Is, is not sober? What sound is that? Uh, 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 uh Beans make face. the sound. Buzz. Oh, yes. totally buzz. Oh. Um, <laughs> it wasn't shit face then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I thought sure the bee was shit face. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, since we're running a, a little bit long time, I'm going to let you redeem yourself a little bit later but you did good we did good i think we didn't get any wrong so that always yeah. helps all right and so i'm gonna give you time to uh plug johnny heller so you can tell everybody how to find you what's coming up everything you want them to know so it's all on you okay besides following me on facebook you can always go to johnnyheller.com and under the workshops tab you'll see the upcoming workshops um, the one up there now is the one that just completed the fourth annual Splendiferous Narrator Workshop that I do every year. So next year will be number five. Um, then the New England Narrator Retreat is a wonderful time for narr. If you're not a narrator, don't think about it. Just want to come and camp out. Don't. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's 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 just nice. Uh, it's in New England. It's gorgeous. Wonderful food. Good time. Very convivial. We had about uh, thirty to sixty participants at most. We have great coaches. We have Sean Pratt, uh, Joanna Perrin, Stephen Cohen, Paul Allen Rubin, Paula Parker, Juliana Wilson from Penguin Random House will be there. So I'm leaving someone out, but I can't remember why. Oh, Caramanda. Lovely Caramanda. Um, before that, Scott Brick and I have our September 15th workshop in New York City. Um, that you'll find on the Scott Brick website. Um, I don't know if it's up yet, but that it, well, that'll be down. Um, that's a great time. It's all about the business of audiobooks. It helps you understand about do you incorporate, how to handle your taxes, and how to stay in touch with publishers, how to meet publishers, how to work on technical stuff. If uh, if you want to have a uh, alter ego, a, a Vox du Poon, so you want to have a different name to do your you know your exciting uh, porno stuff. Um, <laughs> that you want a name for that. This is how to manage those you know different competing names because um, you you. A lot of our job is marketing and social media and stuff. So you need, you know, if, if you're Nom de Poon's, um, they drop in Porto, then you want to have a, a website for that. Right. Um, so what else? And so that, that so there's a bunch of things coming up. So I list them there. I try and keep up to date on my events. I'm easy to reach because because um, I don't make it hard. You can email me. You can uh, respond to anything on my website. You can read my blog. There's history. There's like the 30. I started that. In college, for the hell of it, I wrote a humor column in college, and then when I had my own website, I decided just to uh, uh, bring it back because for the hell of it makes sense. So that's what I do. Um, so that's pretty much what's coming up. And if you want to coach with me, you'll also see uh, how to do that on my website, and you see some reviews of people who have worked with me, what they have to say, and there we go. 
And there you go, everybody. So I'm so excited. You and I finally had this chance to sit down and chat and play a game. We didn't get to have a drink together at APEC, but that's okay. We'll have one at some point. I'm going to follow you and Sean around. You're going to take me to London with you or something. I'm going to carry your bags. <laughs> I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna work that out, but okay. <laughs> it's been fantastic. Thank you so much, Johnny, okay. for hanging out okay. with me today. All right. So long, everybody. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me on. Okay. All right. Have a good one. Bye bye. Bye. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us for this week's episode of the Audio Flow with our special guest Johnny Heller. For this episode and all other episodes of the Audio Flow, feel free to follow us on Facebook at the Audio Flow, also on Instagram at the Audio Flow, and Twitter at the Audio Flow Promotions. Uh, we just changed our hashtag. You can find this episode on iHeartRadio, Tune In, iTunes. Google Play and also on our website at www.theaudioflow.online. Until next time, remember, listening never sounded so good.